right in. Mike. Yeah. <clears throat> we are oh, live, by the way. Cool look, said, I mean, we have a guest in the, you know, sitting there doing this with a, hey, you know, let's put this on something that's a, with the old school. Yeah. Movie, it'll be a good look. Well, I have, we have some of those stands in here. I, yeah, we'll have to figure it out because it didn't. Should work with that other one with the well, uh, see, condenser mic. Right here, it didn't give enough room for something to plug in here. So oh, okay. All right. We're All right, live. Ready? Yeah, we're live. We're, we're already live? Yeah. Mother son of a. Hello, hello, <clears throat> good morning. <laughs> Won't you? Uh, Blake Bass, first on the first in line. Good morning, Blake. So uh, I still haven't been paid in full. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Welcome to the Wake Dot Show. I'm Fisher, along with Johnny Torres. I hope everybody's doing all right this morning. It's uh, you know, it's Monday. It's Monday. Got a nice cup of Joe today. No, yeah. No Diet Coke. Uh, listen, I um, I shouldn't have run through McDonald's on the way in, but I did. It was just uh, one of those things. And it was just one of those mornings where I needed a McGriddle. I, need, <laughs> I needed a hash brown. I needed that fried salt and fat. Yeah. Um, I always get an extra packet of salt because my blood pressure is already high. Okay. And, But if you get a hash brown and it's not salted... It just, it's just like crunchy grease and it's just not good. I have to have that salt to complete the, whatever that the, the chemistry is in my mouth yeah. to light up my brain. You know what, you know what I hear in that whole situation? What? Is, man, I wonder what Johnny would want for breakfast. Hmm. Oh. I, that, I would be a good show partner. I'd be a good, hey, I'm running through McDonald's. What, no, you know, I, I'm looking out uh, for you. You know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to suck you into sure. my, my evil my dark, uh, you know, places of <laughs> fast food every morning until, you know, you end up 250 pounds or whatever. Oh, I'm right there with you, buddy. What's the uh, the most? Which, I do the uh, I, do, I do the cafe con leche and Cuban bread just drowned in butter. Mm. That's uh, oh, kind of oh. my go to quick breakfast, oh, especially what? right here, man. We're, you know, you said what, two miles from West Tampa. And, and what's this uh, place right up the road you took oh, the other La, day? La Bamba. La Bamba. What time oh, do they man. open in the morning? Are they open at Seven. five? Oh, Seven. bastards. Yeah, I know. If they were open at 5 o'clock, we'd swing in there before oh, we came totally in. Be, oh, absolutely. Every single time. So, actually, I know that it's Monday morning and, and whatnot, but uh, I feel pretty good. Uh, and maybe it is the, I got a giant coffee on the way in, but uh, I already have Oddly enough, put- especially considering uh, my Sunday, I'd say I'm feeling pretty good this morning. Uh, what'd you do yesterday? Did you drink yourself into oblivion <laughs> watching the Miami <laughs> Dolphins lose to the Buccaneers? Uh, did they lose? Uh, yeah, we'll get to stuff you should know here in, uh, in just a couple okay. of minutes. Um, we'll get into that. But, but yeah, yeah, they didn't. Well, see, that was a win-win for me because I was born and raised in Miami, now a resident of Tampa Bay for over 10 years. Okay. So no matter who won in that situation, I was good. I was a happy man. Mm. <laughs> so. so what happened? Why are you so rough? Uh, what happened on, uh, on Sunday? Sunday fun so day. So Sunday was great. No, Sunday was great. For, um, overall, it was a great day. I uh, why is this thing having a hard time focusing again? What do you think it is? Your beauty. <laughs> Stop moving. I know. Let me. Let me. I'll. I'll, I'll back it out in a second. Here, I'll give you the the there corner angle. There we go. Um, the old side shot. So got to kind of relax, sleep in a little bit, that sort of thing, and um, and then on uh, and then we. Did a little birthday thing for my daughter down in Miami with the with the family. Oh, so you drove back from Miami yesterday? Yeah, we went uh, down. That's see, and I was hoping to have more time down there. I was hoping we would go down Saturday morning. We ended up not getting down there until Saturday night, and so it ended up being like almost a twenty four hour trip. Um, you know, we had a thing for my daughter, eight did, hours of which on the road. Yeah, right, exactly. And so, uh, basically, eight thirty, nine o'clock rolled around, and I hit the road back to uh tampa last night and luckily it was a smooth drive uh you know there was no traffic and is that where her mom is down in miami uh no i mean you know she she lives up here but we go down there for the holidays because both her family and my family are both down there okay i see yeah. um how many shows are we doing this week 
Man, that's the that Cords is watching, so so we got to answer this very carefully. Well, I mean, I, I'll do I, I, you know, I'll do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, if, if unless you are heading out or something like that. No, well, like I said, I think it'd be kind of cool to maybe try to do a show where uh, a remote show on Wednesday. That'd be awesome. Because uh, if we can pull that off, I'll tell you right now, though, if it works, yeah. Well, then you better believe that Thursday mornings will be remote. <laughs> Every Thursday morning after Park and Rec will be remote. <laughs> I'm getting home at one o'clock in the morning after uh, my Wednesday night gig. Well, see, that's what happened to me last night. So I again, I left Miami about nine o'clock. Um, I strolled into Tampa about one o'clock in the morning. This morning? Yeah. Oh, geez. And so well, here, here, you need. You need this. <laughs> And so I learned a valuable lesson last night because I'm somebody who's prone to falling asleep behind the wheel uh, late at night. Me too. Um, Fortunately, like I said, I got a lot of rest on Sunday. So driving up here Sunday night wasn't that bad. Um, But along the way, stop for gas at Wawa, decide to get uh, a uh, cafe con leche, which they now offer at Wawa, which is pretty amazing. You didn't get a sandwich, and uh, no, I'd already, I'd already had dinner. And um, it's hard to stop but, into a Wawa and not get a sandwich. Oh, I know. Um, but so I, I had a Coke leaving Miami, and then like again, you know, midway stopped at Wawa and filled up on gas and grabbed a cafe con leche. Well, I realized once I got home that that is not a good combination. Oh, so that you you weren't able to go to bed? Oh man, my stomach was a knot uh, all night, man, uh, all night. I got up a few times, and uh, I, I don't need to know about it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be a rough day. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm right, having well, a good hair day though, so that's a win. Okay, you're having a good hair day, a, a bad butt day. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so if you go running out of the studio, I'll know, I'll know what's happening. Exactly. Uh, we'll get to stuff you should know here in just one second, but thank you very again for uh, streaming the Wake Dot Show. I'm Fisher along with Johnny Torres, and all the sharing and liking you can do would be huge. Uh, make sure you're commenting along the way, and uh, we got a lot of uh, you know issues of the day, stories of the day to get to over the next couple of hours. And if uh, there's something that we missed, or there's uh, you know there's something that's piqued your interest, uh, go ahead and throw it in the comments section. We'll yeah. uh, click on it, open up the uh, story, and and chat it up a little bit. Yeah. Good morning, Jeff God Charles, David Capote. Jeffrey. Uh, and uh, Cords is uh, down with the Wednesday uh, idea, so we'll we'll get to test that out on Wednesday. Yeah, I don't think we'll, we don't need to do a show on a Thursday. Uh, you know, I think people will be a little preoccupied. But the, the cool thing about what we're doing here is uh, it's not we both of us individually could fire up our our Facebook account, our wake, yeah. the Wake Dot Show, and uh, you know deliver a little message on Thanksgiving. See, I love the uh, you know as kind of overly commercialized and self-promoting as the uh, Thanksgiving Day parade has gotten. Uh, I, I like it, but I think it'd almost be fun for us to simultaneously like totally rip on it. <laughs> so <laughs> so we'll Beavis and Butthead this thing. It'll be just you and I uh, sitting there watching uh, the Macy's Day parade. Yeah. Uh, you know, making uh, swarmy <laughs> comments. Right. Uh, speaking of... Say, hey, is... Uh, speaking of turkey chin, <laughs> what the hell is this thing here? Is that Rocco... Is Al Roker putting on weight again? <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm shaking my uh, third and fourth, fifth chin uh, for a reason because I'm very excited to talk to uh, uh, Eric Stratman over the weekend. For those of you in the Bay Area that have been in the uh, CrossFit world at all over the last two, 10 years, you definitely know that name. Uh, but he is somebody back in the beginning of his uh, career of, of opening up uh, gyms I got to know, and he was actually a personal trainer of mine for a little while. I think I told you guys about the uh, stint I had. I tried grappling for a couple of weeks, you know, wrestling. Oh, yeah. And, uh, I mean, it was fun. Don't get me wrong. I I, uh, I, don't know, I, just, I was just like, man, I, at the time I was, I don't know, 39, 38. <laughs> and uh, one day, because I told you this about the 16-year-old, right? Yeah. Um, or, I, or I remember if he was 16 or 17. He was a minor. He was under 18, whatever it was. And so as I'm sitting there joking around and whatever, you know, I'm learning how to grapple and this and that. They're like, well, why don't you grapple this kid over here? And, I mean, it was a, you know, a, a small guy. He's, you know, a skinny guy. And I'm like, no, I know better. I know what you guys are doing. I might have him by 50 pounds. We'll help, probably have me pinned, you know. And, no, I probably had him by, like, 70 pounds. And I'm sure that will have me pinned in no time. And they're like, oh, you should. And then I find out that the kid was, you know, 16 or 17. I'm like, what the hell are you guys thinking? This is a lose-lose proposition. First of all, if I uh, beat the kid, what's that? (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, so you're a uh, so 250 pound, 38 year old man that beat up a 16 year old. Good for you. If I lose to the kid, well, then, uh, you know, that sucks. And then worst case scenario is <clears throat> something goes wrong and the kid breaks his arm or something. And next thing you know, it's a headline local radio DJ, uh, you know, breaks the arm of a minor. So I, uh, that's not why I gave up grappling. It was just one of the stories that I like to tell coming out of uh, grappling. Anyway, Eric Stratman is uh, is big time now. He is he's moved to New York and has started uh, a, another. Co- oh, I'm, I'm going to get all the details today. Uh, later on today, do you see what it's trying to focus in on? I wonder if it's true. Yeah, let me. What see. do you think it is? Not sure. Hold on. Um, but anyway, we're going to have. Uh, I'm going to talk to him after the show today, and then we are going to include him. Uh, in his program and and uh, and me going through it on the show. So that way, every single week, as you guys are trying to, uh, you know, uh, maintain weight through the holidays or do whatever it is you got to do coming out of the holidays, you'll uh, be able to follow along every week as I get half naked and do the measurements, you know, on. Whoa, hey, there we are. Hi, me. <laughs> I uh, uh-huh. I didn't know it was going to be like this this morning. I would have clipped my nose hairs a little bit. All right. So, uh, so yeah, this part. Oh, wait a second. Some, some happened over here on our end. So I think we're still streaming audio, but for some reason, our our camera feed is frozen. Hmm. All right. So uh, as long as everything's still working on uh, on your end, uh, make sure you share, share, share. Let me go to Facebook here myself. Yeah. And then we'll uh, get to stuff you should know <clears throat> after a couple more sips of coffee. Good morning and welcome to the Wake Dot Show. The Wake Dot Show. And if you're just tuning in, you're probably going, what the hell? You're just sitting there staring at your computer and there's no audio. Well, you tuned in at the right time. Yeah. We still having issues? Yeah. Um, but you can go ahead and, like I said, I think uh, our, our audio should still be streaming. Um, not sure what's going on here. It seems to be... Oh, it froze? Well, oh. the video froze, but uh, I'm still seeing audio levels go through. Yeah, see, so Sarah, good morning, Sarah. Uh, she's saying frozen video, but we can still hear you guys. So it's just like the radio, man. <laughs> now I'm really right. in my ele- element. <laughs> right. uh, good morning, everybody. Chords, when you uh, come in, make sure you come to the studio. I want to chat it up about something. But anyway, so, so back to this thing. Now, uh, you know, when I'm on the radio, uh, or when I was on the radio, obviously there's not a lot of cameras in the studio. Well, these days, I guess that's changed a little bit. But um, uh, for the most part, people can't see you. So you'll notice... Even on camera, that I'm sitting here, I'm you know, stuff you'll never see on TV. I'm stretching and all this kind of stuff. You're not gonna, you know, tune in and all of a sudden one of your morning news anchors are just sitting there, still trying to wake up. That's still, you know, that's the, the leftovers from radio is not caring what you look like. Yeah. Uh, however, when I'm watching this every, you know, walking, watching back to this uh, every day, I uh, there's 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 something I can't help but notice. Now, probably for most people, you know, whatever, I I look like this and it's no big deal. But I, I you know, I I don't look like this to in my head to me so um so i've definitely noticed that and we're going to add a a health element to the show i don't think that fixed it i was hoping that uh that might fix it but <clears throat> Um, indeed. Yeah. So, the, well, again, our audio is still streaming. Okay. Just not, stuff you uh, should know then here. Yeah, just not our um, our video. Oh, and I'm not getting audio from my board this morning. We're off to a great start. <clears throat> yeah, man. It's okay. You know, you're uh, you're sitting on the toilet, uh, getting ready to start your day. And uh, this is something nice to listen to. Uh, it'll relax your bowels. Yeah. <laughs> Let me get to the sound. USB. You're sitting on the Whoa. toilet, Whoa. Uh, getting ready to start your day. <laughs> the to- <laughs> that's the if that's not the best part. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Oh man. Uh, let me bring this down. Oh well, we're, we're we're assuming everybody's getting ready for work and getting their day started anyway, so. Uh, hopefully they're not missing out on much by seeing our ugly mugs. Uh, stuff you should know. Hey, stuff old school. You know. Stuff you should know. Stuff you should know. 
All right, let's get to stuff you should know for Monday, November 20th. Charles Manson convicted of orchestrating the 1969 murders of pregnant actress Sharon Tate and six others is dead of natural causes. 83 uh, years he lived. He was allowed to uh, live in prison. And as a matter of fact, I guess uh, something I didn't realize, but he was um, actually sentenced to death. And then the Supreme Court at the time had switched some things around or While Hollywood director Brett Ratner watched. Now, this Brett Ratner guy is already caught up in a few, uh, at least a few al- allegations. Yeah, which is, uh, well, I mean, for me personally, I'd say Russell Simmons has probably got to be the most disappointing one so far. Um, but Ratner, of course, very talented director. And uh, Gal Gadot, who is uh, now, uh, I think, will live in infamy as Wonder Woman on the big screen. Uh, she's already said that she will not do another Wonder Woman film if Brett, Brett Ratner is uh, still associated with the project. The alleged victim told the L.A. Times that Simmons began pulling her clothes off. She was fighting this off. And she looked over to Brett and said, quote, help me, mouth, help me. And I'll never forget the look in his face, she said. In that moment, the realization fell over me that they were in it together. Uh, Morrissey comments on Hollywood sexual abuse scandal. They tur- quote, they turn it around and say, I was attacked. I was surprised. But if everything went well and if it had given them a great career, they wouldn't talk about it. Yeah. So, so this is Morrissey uh, saying, hey. Um, don't trust all these women. If if they they put themselves out there in these the situation, uh, they were looking to uh, gain themselves. And had they gained, they wouldn't be saying anything right now. But uh, they don't gain enough, and then all of a sudden, it's harassment and rape and so on. We will come back to that story, discuss that coming up on the show today. Videos back. All right, welcome back. Uh, Despite Hurricane Irma or the threat of Zika, tourists still flock to Florida in record numbers. Governor Rick Scott will announce today that a record 88.2 million visitors came to the state during the first nine months of this year. And that's a 3.3 increase, 3.3 percent increase uh, for the same amount of time last year. Thanks, Puerto Rico. (laughs) <laughs> so too soon <laughs> well so, so what you're saying is that the majority of that uh, happened all in the last month <laughs> yeah. month and a half. those That's, aren't tourists those are refugees uh, man orlando will never be the same i'm gonna tell you right now are they, they got a huge influx now oh yeah oh yeah there's there was already a large uh puerto rican population oh, yeah. there oh yeah and uh this really is just uh, it's going to be explosive i mean uh because they also know miami's overcrowded and uh, there's not a lot of job opportunities there. Tampa, I think, is also going to get a large influx. Uh, I mean, again, my, my daughter's uh, mom, you know, my ex uh, is a high school teacher, and she says she's already gotten, I think, about a half a dozen new students uh, from uh, evacuees of uh, Hurricane Maria. You look good with color on you. Thanks, man. That uh, colorful shirt this morning. By the way, I'm not teasing you. I'm being serious. Well, on a black and white background, you know, yeah. it's good to figure Make- I can color it up. Yeah, you're popping this morning. <laughs> you look 3D. Yes. Uh, Next up, President Trump said that his administration will soon announce its decision on the controversial practice of allowing elephant trophies to be imported to the uh, U.S. Quote, big game trophy decision will be announced this next week, meaning this week, uh, but will be very hard pressed to change my mind that this horror show in any way helps conservation of elephants or any other animal. Trump tweeted, but we'll see how this uh, plays out. A college radio host. Now, this is college radio. Uh, what radio station? I'll let you know real quick. It's uh, KU, KUMM. <laughs> no, get out. <laughs> University of Minnesota at Morris or something, Morristown or something like that. It's it's So it's UMM, and the radio station is KUMM. Uh, College radio show host has been suspended for using the word tranny on his show. Oh, come on. 15 minutes later, the station manager of KUMM walked into the studio with a campus officer, said they had broken FCC violations. Nope. FCC rules. They did not. You're right. That was a lie. And escorted them out of there. But there was no, there's, there's no FCC violations against that. No. They made that up. Uh, the sentencing phase has now begun for the convicted, convicted murderer Adam Ma, um, uh, Matos. Matos. 
Probably Matos, yeah. Here in the uh, Bay Area, he admitted to uh, killing Megan Brown, Greg Brown, Margaret uh, Brown, and Nick Leonard, but claimed that self-defense and paranoia led to the brutal quadruple homicide. Uh, he will either get life in prison without parole or death. And uh, now, now in the state not, of- not the Seminole Heights killer either, by the way. I, I thought originally, when I first heard that story, I'm like, okay, four victims. I thought, you know, oh, man, they caught him, and uh, that is not the case. No, no, different guy. Um, now, uh, in the state of Florida now, they've changed the rules within the last year or two, and it has to be a unanimous jury. Uh, in order to get the death penalty beforehand, it didn't have to be unanimous. Uh, but I guess we're figuring if you're going to put somebody to death, <laughs> we want to get everybody on board on that one. Uh, the NFL is investigating Tampa Bay Buccaneers quarterback Jameis Winston after an Uber driver accused him of groping her in 2016. A league spokesperson told the told CBS News on Friday that the matter is under review. Uh, he had one of his friends, a former teammate, come out and say, hey, hey, I, and the guy plays for the Eagles now, Darby. Yep. Uh, said, I, don't know, I was in the car. This never happened. He wasn't even sitting in the front seat. It was the back seat with me. There was a third NFL player unnamed thus far uh, in the front seat. None of the stuff went down the way she, that she said it went down. Yeah, the the only thing here that uh, people are questioning is just that, uh, and, and again, and, you know, uh, if you have a best friend, this isn't rare, uh, f- uh, but people are saying that uh, Darby just kind of seems to be around when these things happen. And, uh, well, so, he's, yeah, you're right. So they're because, wondering if, if they're covering for him. Yeah, well, because uh, from one, if I remember correctly, this guy was uh, around for those sexual assault allegations at Florida yeah. State. Right. So there's that. Uh, and Jameis Winston was not playing yesterday as the Tampa Bay Buccaneers beat the Miami Dolphins uh, 30-20. Ryan Fitzpatrick was under a center for the uh, Buccaneers yesterday. Um, go Bucks! <laughs> 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 they approved to a 4-6. and six. Yeah. Uh, I feel bad for my uh, dear friend uh, Jesse Cage, who's a huge, huge Miami Dolphin fan. And he figured this was, and the Dolphins aren't looking that great this year. Well, and I've, I've been on the fence about this, right? Because... I've I've I adopted the Rays as my baseball team uh, when uh, after the whole Marlin Stadium issue uh, and all the controversy behind that the the new stadium yeah the new Marlin Stadium I hated the rebranding I hate the stadium it was like uh, a carnival I love it <laughs> especially that damn statue out in center field um, so I said you know what I'm officially a Rays fan right so I kind of gave up my Marlins membership. And, uh, and but I haven't been able to bring myself to do so with the Bucks yet. I think it they haven't earned it yet. Um, Wait, they haven't earned you giving up on them? Is that what you're talking about? The, the, <laughs> that's right. Uh, so still a Dolphins fan. Oh, oh, oh for, I see first and saying. foremost. I but like I said at the start of the show, that's a win-win for me because uh, you know I still want to see the Bucks do well. <laughs> well, I uh, I love my Buccaneers, and uh, I uh, you know we've talked about fanship and fandom. I, I'm not the fanatical fan that I used to be in my younger days, but I I still really want to see the Bucks on Sunday, even if they're losing, even if they're, you know, two and ten and we're going into season thirteen. Sure. Um I still want to see them play. Um so so I guess when I when I go on that little commentary or tirade about how, you know, it put sports in its proper place of entertainment, that that's not that's not one hundred percent true. There's still a part of me that gets that, sure. that just gets sucked into uh, sports, dude. I'm so pumped about the Canes right now. Oh man! Now I don't care about the, uh, the I don't care about the Canes so much. Although anytime that the Florida a team is doing well, then I'm good. I'm good. Uh, but uh, anyway, enough about that. Uh, that stuff you should know. Let me uh, let me play that uh, theme song again, just because. Just because. We need to get you a soundboard. I know. Stuff you should know. Stuff you should know. Stuff you should know. Stuff you should know. Always love that. Love it. Yeah. Now I want to bring in uh, the owner of Bake More Pies here, Cords, uh, for a minute because, uh, well, well, just because. Because we can. Because he's a good interview. Yeah. Also, we, I mean, we, we talked about Mondays being our, uh, our marketing minute Mondays or something like that. We, we haven't quite decided on the uh, clever name for it yet, but. Oh, there we go. Marketing Minute Mondays. Here's how to. All right, now now, now you have to come back up here and zoom out. I do. <laughs> or you come come in a little bit closer. Tight. Good morning. Welcome in. Good morning. How was your weekend there, Courts? It was excellent. All right. 
I uh, I wanted to bring you in this morning because uh, I want to share with some people uh, a little backstory, a little a little story actually, and uh, and then uh, get your reaction to it. Okay. All right. So uh, when I first came into these studios and was uh, trying to figure out what show we're going to do, and I was in the the main big room, I was breaking out my equipment, and you and I had conversations about this microphone, this style microphone. Mm-hmm. And so uh, as we as we moved forward a few weeks later, I was just I just felt compelled. It was just one of those things that I don't know why, I just felt compelled to donate because uh, I have a few of these. And these are very classic microphones in the radio world. You will uh, you'll find them everywhere. And uh, they're not cheap either. Um, so so I donated one to bake more pies and that's the if you if you go onto your video screen there or your camera there Johnny, you'll see the uh, you'll see it. Yeah, there we go. That this one, right one this beautiful microphone right here, ladies and gentlemen. So on Friday, uh, Cords and I are talking because we all love this show. We love the potential where you know where this possibly could go, but the reality is is that eventually we got to figure out a way to make some money. Well, uh, and 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 have also shared that this is a bone of contention in the Fisher household with my wife. And I. <laughs> so Cords go uh, came to me on Friday and said, "Hey, listen, man, I was looking up online what these microphones go for, you know, used, and I've seen that they go for about two hundred and fifty bucks. I know what's going on at home. How about I uh, I cut you a check for two hundred and fifty dollars, and I and I pay you for the microphone, and maybe that'll relieve some of the uh, the tension at home." And uh, when he first said that, my first inclination was to say, no, that's, that, that doesn't feel right. I don't like it. But I was overrode by another by a scream in my head. <laughs> and I said, smart. And I go, okay, let's do it. I go, yes, thank you. I thank you. That's, that, that, that means a lot. And so in my head, I'm thinking this, this is going to be like a sign. You know, I'll show my wife, hey, look, the, these people aren't messing around over there. They're serious, all right? So, you know, let's, let's, let's work hard to make this work. So she gets home on Friday night. And I tell her the story. I set up the story to her. And when I told her what you did, she goes, no, give the money back. She goes, you can't do that. That, what, that was something that you gave to them. And, they're, and this is something that's important. She goes, they're already doing so much for you. You can't accept that money. And that was just like, like a game changer in my head because I thought for, you know, it feels like sometimes that she and I are on, on different pages when it comes to this, but we're not. We're on the same page. We div- we're in the same book. We're in the same chapter, maybe on different pages sometimes. But uh, uh, but in that moment, it was a huge relief for me because uh, I, I, she was right. So I'm I'm giving your check back to you. Okay, we'll do that. Well, here we go. This is in my pocket. Oh man, <laughs> we're gonna go visual. Well, it, it, one of the reasons why like it bothered, it's ceremonial. Why <laughs> the check presentation, <clears throat> the check give back. Uh, but one of the reasons why. Um, it bothered me so much on Friday is because I didn't buy these microphones. These microphones were donated to uh, the FNK podcast, me and Jesse Cage and Ed Gruby, uh, by somebody who's a huge fan of radio mm-hmm. and a huge you know, appreciates all the stuff that goes along with radio and of us and what we were doing at the time. Sure. So to me, the the passing on of something like that is, is something much more... Uh, I don't know, special and and meaningful than an exchange of money for it. Um, so when she said that, it was such a huge relief for me because I feel like I was doing something wrong by selling you that microphone. But in my head, I'm going, well, if this will alleviate some of the stuff that's going on at home, then I, I got to do it. Sure. All right. So here's what I'm... <laughs> the check presentation. So the, so the, check, <laughs> the check presentation... Uh, back, <laughs> back to uh, uh, bake more pies. All right, we'll accept it. it and not only that, but uh, on top of that, I brought in another microphone, which is the microphone you're, you're. I'm not donating this one. This one's called a crooner, right? Yeah, 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 it's a crooner microphone. And because you know, we, the guests that we've had so far, we give them a handheld mic. Yeah. And and then they might be here with it. They might be here with it. Uh, so we can put that on a stand, and they'll and, uh, and our guests that come in will have this uh, natural crooner mic. But, Sounds great, by the way. The uh, the microphone itself, yeah, I, that's just cords. He makes any microphone sound good. <laughs> yeah, right. that's all right. Southern twang. I know. Right? All right. So, what are your thoughts on that? What are your, th- uh, your thoughts? On no, that? I'm, I well, just listening to your story, <clears throat> it uh, it makes me you know very appreciative that she understands what we're trying to do here. 
she also said that she does feel like you're good people not trying to take advantage yeah. of me because I think that's mm -hmm. one thing that you were worried about in your head. Right. This will show her, hey, we're not trying to take advantage of your husband. You know, we're we're both pushing for something that we see right over the horizon. Right. Uh, but so give this to, you know, because I even joked uh, when he first wrote it, I go, did you write it right to Lauren? <laughs> he goes, no, I wrote it to the man of the house. And I go, yeah, Lauren. <laughs> that's terrible. Now, I, I certainly appreciate her understanding of what we're trying to get done in here and how we're trying to revolutionize and give you your power back, you know, in the uh, uh, in terms of being able to have control over what you're talking about and how you do your show. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I appreciate what you guys are uh, doing for uh, me around here. And I think the Wake Dot Show is going to turn into something special. I, I think it is, too. All right. Absolutely. Well, thank you for stopping by, Gord. Right, thank you. Hey, I got an idea. Yeah. I got an idea for that uh, that 250 bucks. Let's put it in a, a little fund. Okay. And then uh, here in the next, uh, you know, week or two when we feel like this is it. All right. We've got our, we, uh, we we feel good about everything from, because we still need a show open, really. Mm -hmm. You know, something for the open. We still see, need something there for the end instead of just going, okay, is that it? All right. Turn <laughs> off the cameras. <laughs> and uh, when we get that, why don't we, uh, once you put that aside and we will strategize on how to best push out the new show and get uh, as many listeners as we can as we take it to, uh, you know, potential business partners. Perfect. We'll leave it in the show. That sounds great. All right. Well, that was just a suggestion, by the way. I wasn't trying. Yeah. I think I think the show deserves it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Cord, the owner of uh, Bake More Pies here at a Bake More Pie Studios in uh, Tampa. Here's your mic. Back. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go back through uh, some of the stuff you should know. Hey, can I, uh, I'll tell you also where that, uh, part of where that came from on Friday, you know, the, uh, it, it bothering me. Um, there was a, there's a, there's a gentleman that I met in Arkansas a few years ago when I was helping a buddy of mine out there, you know, put a couple of businesses, you know, get the couple of businesses off the ground. And I failed miserably. That's not the point. <laughs> the point was I'm there in the Ozarks, the base of the Ozarks. And meeting a lot of really cool, interesting people. One of those interesting people was a guy by the name of Clinton. Clinton, uh, what the hell is his last name? Clinton Coonfield. Oh, man. That's a Midwestern name if I've ever heard Clinton of him. Clinton Coonfield from Fayetteville, Arkansas. Well, Southern name, really. Yeah, and I forget his middle name, too, because the middle name really, I mean, it just it just pounds it out perfectly. It, 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 even, it gets 10 times more Southern. Well, I'm sure Buford, he's on the Facebook. Like Buford or something, you know, Clinton Buford, you know. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, Clinton Coonfield, and um, he was one of the people that were was, I was working with uh, over that summer. Um, somebody who grew up in the Ozarks and has a lot of really cool stories to tell. But you know, mountain man works with his hands all of his life. So anyway, before I left and came back to Florida, we were talking, and he gave me um, a multi tool. I know it might not seem like much, much, but it was a Leatherman multi-tool. You could tell it was a little older in this really nice case. And you can tell it's been used quite a bit. And it was something that he just, I don't know, felt compelled to give to me as a little token of his, of his appreciation and of uh, our time there in Arkansas. And, uh, and it just, it meant a lot because, you know, this, it wasn't like being in some, you know, rich guy's house and, uh, you know, that has way too much. And the person is going, hey, are you, hey, you can have that. Oh, you can have that. This guy has next to nothing. And for whatever reason, gave me his multi-tool. And it's something that means a lot to me. Yeah. Um, I've had it ever since. And when I thought it was lost, it was something that I it really bothered me that I thought somebody had stolen it at some point. But we, in the move, we found it. And I feel good about it now. But the same kind of th it was the same kind of thing that I was was happening to me when I wanted to give you guys that microphone. And I know it seems so like stupid and meaningless and whatever. No, but not I really at all. Did. There was something I just felt compelled. I mean, these are nice microphones that I love and yeah. I would hoard. I, I you know, but <laughs> uh, but I, I I just wanted to give it to you guys because I feel like you guys are doing something special around here. Yeah. Uh, I really like the energy when I'm walking, you know, when I'm, when we're not just stuck into this little uh, closet, we're walking among everybody, amongst everybody. And, um, I well, know. I, I, I know that for chords, I know it meant a lot for you to do that, uh, because, uh, again, he's done an amazing job here in outfitting this facility with all the tools and resources we need. And he understands the value in having quality equipment like that. These mics, again, are almost a gold standard in radio. Uh, they, they were in just about every radio station I ever worked in. And he, he, trust me, he knows exactly not only, you know, the dollar value, but also the significance 
significance of you, uh, you know, donating these here to the studio. And uh, I know he, he really appreciated it beyond whatever, you know, dollar amount was on that check. Well, let's get back to uh, the stuff you should know that we were uh, going over earlier and, uh, and flesh it out a little bit. Charles Manson, the California drifter turned cult leader responsible for a string of murders that cast a dark, pale pall over the summer of 1969, died Sunday night, I guess uh, officially Sunday night. Because he was on uh, his deathbed by Friday, or was that early Saturday? Yeah, I was going to say, I thought, I thought he had died on Friday, but apparently not. Uh, Deborah Tate, the sister of the actress Sharon Tate, one of Manson's most famous victims, received a call from uh, the Corcoran State Prison telling her Manson had died at 8.13 p.m. Well, Manson died of natural causes. Tate knew he'd been sick for a long time, wasn't expecting this. Uh, Manson was recently taken to a hospital and was being treated for intestinal bleeding since January. Surgery was recommended, Mm. but later deemed too risky. And he was was. 83. (laughs) Uh, It's it's weird because I guess if you're of a certain age, you know, old enough to remember this stuff, I'm sure this plays out very differently than for those of us that were born in, you know, 1972. Yeah. Uh, Because to me, he is... uh, I don't have I don't have an opinion about the guy because he was he's in a weird way a pop culture icon. Well, he's been part of uh, again, like you said, he's been part of the pop culture kind of uh, lexicon or galaxy for so long that uh, he's almost mythical. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, he had been locked up since his arrest in December of 1969, following his conviction for orchestrating the murders of actress Sharon Tate and six others. Some of the other uh, f- uh, of his followers remain behind bars for their part in the killing. One, Lynette Squeaky Fromm, is that her name, uh, attempted to kill President Gerald Ford and was later released on parole in 2009. Only in America. Yeah. You can attempt to assassinate a president and end up uh, on the streets eventually. Uh, these children, quote, these children that come at you with knives, they are your children. You taught them. I didn't teach them. I just tried to help them stand up, he said in a courtroom soliloquy. This was a madman, a crazy man. I wonder what it was about uh, our society that got so was so fascinated, so enamored with him. And I know you can't answer that. You're you know younger no. than I am, unless I think it was the drugs. I'll do it every <laughs> single time. Uh, so over the weekend, I, I I get a text from Johnny Torres, and it's this story here: Russell Simmons. Brett Ratner faced new allegations of sexual misconduct. And I just, I think I just t- text you back next. Yeah. Like, like you feel like you're, uh, you're sitting in a subway line or, you know, a Publix waiting for your, um, your order and you're, you're, you're holding a number next. We're serving number. We're serving Russell Simmons and Brett Ratner <laughs> next. Well, and, and the crazy thing is we were talking about him on Friday. Uh, no, I'm sorry. We talked about him on Wednesday when we had Cam Parker on. Uh, because you were asking who I'd kind of interacted with celebrity wise on Twitter. And I said, probably the biggest celebrity, I think, uh, you know, business, entertainment, or anything was Russell Simmons. And Russell Simmons ends up, ends up in the news uh, not too long after that you said that. Carrie Clausen, do you know how to say this last name? Uh, hold on. Kaligi, Kaligi, Kaligi was a 17 year old fashion model. I think that's f- close, yeah. From a farm town in Nebraska when she met Brett Ratner and Russell Simmons at a casting call. Ratner was an up and coming. I wouldn't I I don't know how parents would ever allow their their children um, to ever be alone with anybody in the entertainment industry. (laughs) You know, directors, uh, producers go to a casting call by themselves. I I don't know. I I could never in a million years uh, do something like that. I could see that changing. I could see, uh, you know, certain policies or standards being put in place now uh, as, as more of this comes to surface. Corey Feldman is still out there beating his drum. I mean, he was on Dr. Oz and he's starting to name names and uh, it's not good. I mean, no big names, which is why I don't think he's gotten any headlines for it. Um, but uh, he, he's starting to come out and talk a little bit more about the a lot of the pedophilia, you know, a lot of the child molestation and stuff that's going on in Hollywood as well. We'll talk about him uh, next along and then after that, Morrissey. Morrissey is, uh, this is very interesting because isn't Morrissey asexual or something like that? I don't know. I think he's like an amoeba. I know he wants to hang the DJ. That's all I know. Uh-huh. Uh, so Rat- <laughs> So here we go. Uh, Ratner was an up and coming music video director and a protege of Simmons. 
at Def, uh, the Def Jam Records mogul. They took uh, this girl to dinner one night in 1991 at Mr. Chow in New York and then back to Simmons' apartment to show her a music video they'd been working on. Quickly, Simmons began making aggressive sexual advances, yanking off her clothes, she said. Quote, I looked over at Brett and said, help me. And I'll never forget the look on his face. In that moment, the realization fell on me that they were in it together. Holy crap. Well, well what his, a disgusting, be- yeah. uh, 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 a nauseous feeling that must have been in that moment of betrayal. Well, it's similar to the Sylvester Stallone story. And uh, and then also, I mean, Brett Brett's, Ratner's name has been in this area in this universe for quite some time and it, like it, shortly after the stuff came out about uh um what the hell, harvey weinstein like his name was right behind him yeah and multiple s- allegations and so what i think what we're seeing here with weinstein and ratner is that they're now kind of creating this black hole type of situation where they're just starting to drag people down with them you know and uh, not by design i just think that people are connecting the dots and now, you know, you're going to see other people that were in that universe be sucked right into this, uh, you know, all this uncovering, all this uh, revelation that's happening. Uh, this 17-year-old model said that Simmons, who was then about twice her age, tried to force her to have intercourse. Quote, I fought it wildly. He eventually relented and coerced uh, her to perform oral sex, she alleged. I guess I just acquiesced. Um, so I guess at some point, uh, you know, he was, according to her allegations, he was forcibly trying to rape her. She kept fighting it, and eventually she, he was able to turn that into uh, her performing oral, and she says, I guess I just gave in at that point. Uh, Ratner, meanwhile, quote, just sat there and watched, she said. Feeling disgusting, she said she went to take a shower. Minutes later, she alleged that Simmons walked up behind her in the shower and briefly, briefly uh, penetrated her without her consent. She said she jerked away, then he left. It hurt so much. In a statement, Simmons 60 strongly disputed her account. Quote, everything that occurred between Carrie and me occurred with her full consent and participation, he said. Much of the two days and one night spent with her, he said, was with other people or in public. Ratner had no recollection, re- recollection of asking him for help and denied witnessing her protest. Ratner also uh, disputed the accounts of four other women who accused him of sexual misconduct in the story. So there's your boy, Russell, Russell Simmons. Man, that's... I mean, uh, this, this, I mean, and this he, stuff and is that's, disgusting. Well, and that's the mountaintop right there. I mean, you're talking about the biggest media mogul in hip-hop right there, and uh, and it could be it could all be over after this. Um, and, and, and again, what a lot of people are struggling with is like, okay, well, how much time has gone by, and should that be a factor? You know, should, uh, you know, or should, you know, our charges able to be pressed um what should be the appropriate fallout for something like this well if it's true if it's provable then i i I, you you throw everything at the person that you can possibly throw at them but the fact is is this thing's almost 20 years old uh there's doubt well, depending on the, any evidence. Well, and depending on the state that you live in you know the statute of limitations might have run out uh, since November 1st, uh, the November 1st report, which detailed allegations of harassment, groping, and forced oral sex, additional women contacted Tides about Ratner, who has uh, directed, produced, and financed uh, successful films, including Rush Hour, The Revenant, and Horrible uh, Bosses. Next up on this, uh, we got two more. Stay, stay with us. Stay with <laughs> us. We have to keep talking about it, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think this is... I mean, it's painful now, and uh, and it's disappointing and discouraging. You know that uh, our culture, especially our pop culture, is uh, being kind of revealed in this way. But I think that's the only way that you move forward and you progress. Child star Corey Feldman has named another of his alleged abusers after calling out Hollywood in a startling confession. A week after naming two of his six alleged abusers, the '80s icon and star of The Goonies, Gremlins, and Stand by Me made a second appearance. On the Dr. Oz show, describing the whirlwind since naming and shaming the men who allegedly molested him as a child. It's been a whirlwind, that's for sure. It's been a crazy few weeks, obviously, since all this took place and started. It's been emotional. It's been up and down. Some of it's been exhilarating to see some truths finally come to light, he said. On the other side of the coin, it's been nerve-wracking because 
There's been so many questions. Everybody wants to know so much. Now, in the episode of Dr. Oz, Corey named the a third of his alleged abu- abusers Alfie Hoffman. Yep. Whose uh, real name is Alfie Rivas. Quote, he was the guy who ran Alfie's Soda Pop Club. So what was Alfie's Soda Pop Club? I guess Alfie's Soda Pop Club was a disco uh, that was just for kids, 16 and under. And I guess for a couple years in the late 80s, like 86 to 89, it was the place to be in Hollywood for for teenagers. And uh, so you could find Alyssa Milano, Tori Spelling, Corey Haim, Feldman, Scott Grimes, Christina Applegate, all of them. Uh, They danced all night long. Now, according to former DJs who played sets at the event, uh, the gigs were, quote, never that organized or supervised. It was a teen free-for-all, unquote. Uh, Feldman named bit actor and his former assistant John Grissom as one of his alleged abusers during an appearance on Dr. Oz last week. He also claimed that Grissom abused Haim, who started the 1987 cult classic The Lost Boys, on Megyn Kelly today. Uh, Feldman also named a child talent manager and convicted sex offender Marty Weiss, who has not commented on the allegations. And this is what uh, Johnny was talking about earlier: is that if you go, man, how, how if if why is, if Feldman's out there naming all these names, how come we're not talking about that as much? I well, think it's because you don't know the names. And what ticks me off about it too, and it's because of the names not being a list names, the uh, names that people know or remember. Is, is that he's not getting any mainstream press over this. So he ends up on Dr. Oz, which is a syndicated television show, and, uh, and, and he's not really getting this message out as much as it should be. I guess this is uh, inside that soda pop club in the late 80s. Oh, that's the 80s. Already. Is that Alyssa Milano? Oh, look, isn't that a kid from... Uh... And I think this is Alyssa Milano here. Bring that down a little bit. Was feeling so bad. I asked my family doctor just for what I had. <laughs> I can't rec- I don't the, recognize the, the guy. The un-PC banner there. What is that? I mean, it shows you uh, how far we've come. It's called the Crippled Children's Society. <laughs> And you say you think you re- recognize a little kid on stage? Yeah, that wasn't that uh, man. I, I I don't remember the name of the TV show. Wasn't it like um, what was that show about the the butler? Oh, there's Corey Feldman there. Oh, and there's Corey. That's Haim. Yeah, that's Haim right there, right? Looks a little bit like him. All right, it's I recognize. Oh yeah, it's there's not Feldman. Haim, it's, then it's, Feldman's in the red shirt. Right. So. Yeah, what was that show with the uh, with the butler? Uh, Be- was it Belvedere? Uh, yeah, uh, Silver uh, Spoons. I think that that little kid. I think the the smallest kid there on the stage. I think was from uh, maybe from Belvedere. Alfie Soda Shop Club was run by two men. One named Alfie, along with sponsor. Who's the Raymond boss? Hunter, That's what he, uh, David saying. Who was a co-owner of the New York Seltzer, a soft drink brand at the time? Feldman and Haim hosted the de- debut party. Footage on YouTube shows Randy jumping off the eleventh floor of the. Uh, Mondoran Hotel in Los Angeles with a bottle of New York seltzer in his hand. They would eventually turn it into a commercial. Um, so there, uh, Corey Feldman's out there uh, uh, trying to um, drive home the point that uh, pedophilia and molestation is rampant in Hollywood. And even though we're talking about stuff, you know, going back to the 80s, I guess his thought is that stuff hasn't stopped. Well, I mean, his best friend killed himself over it. Was that the motivation of a suicide? Uh, I think I think he believes it's partially the motivation. Oh. I think he struggled with that his entire life. All right. Well, what about this next story, though? And that is of Morrissey. Um, Morrissey commenting on Hollywood sexual abuse scandal says some victims victims are just disappointed. That doesn't make any sense to you. He says some vic. How, what do you mean some victims are just disappointed? What could that possibly mean? He's talking, saying that these so-called victims or some of these victims were people who purposefully put themselves in these positions, knew exactly what they were doing, and were hoping to get some uh, a career gain out of it. And the only reason that some of these people will be coming forward now is just because they're disappointed that their career didn't end up being as uh, awesome as they were hoping. Sure. Morrissey has invited fresh criticism over comments he made about Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey. 
The former Smith's frontman spoke about the original sexual harassment scandal in Hollywood, reportedly calling claims against Spacey ridiculous and arguing that definitions of harassment and assault have become too broad. Now, this is weird coming from Morrissey because I always thought he was asexual and I figured he'd probably be staying out of this conversation. Yeah. But it's, it, now now I'm wondering if uh, he's got a few of these stories in his past where he's coerced people because of the power that he had and he's uh, worried about the, you know that stuff coming up. Well, coming this, is, this is also what we're seeing happen in this kind of situation, like, for example, with Richard Dreyfus, where some of the people that are coming out and speaking out against this and you know claiming moral high ground in this kind of situation uh, are exposing themselves, and then all of a sudden people are being like, oh, yeah, I remember that guy. He did X and X and X and X and X. And now, and, and so it's uncovering more allegations because these people are coming out there trying to act like uh, they had nothing to do with any of this. Says, as far as I know, he was in a bedroom with a 14-year-old. Kevin Spacey was 26, boy 14. One wonders where the boy's parents were. Yeah. How is that? I mean, Ra- that, Rachel. No, that, Rachel. That, no, that's not a part of the discussion. That's that that gets thrown in there when people want to don't want to talk about the truth. Sure. The same thing is happening with Roy Moore in Alabama. Well, where was that 14-year-old girl's parents? Well, great question. That's question number 50. That's question number 50 on our list of questions about what happened. We're going to start with question one, two, three. We'll get to 50 eventually and where the parent was, but it really doesn't matter uh, where the parent was. Sorry. Quote, as far as I know, he says, one wonders if the boy did not know what would happen. It doesn't matter if the boy knew what was going to happen or not. It didn't ma- it doesn't matter if the boy wanted it to happen. Yeah, that's that's the point there too. Even with the Moore situation, even if the the girls consented to it uh in any way, uh it doesn't make it right. I do not know about you, but in my youth, I have never been in a situation like this. Never. No. I was always aware of what could happen. When you are in somebody's bedroom, you have to be aware of what that can lead to. That's why it doesn't sound very credible to me. It seems to me that Spacey has been attacked unnecessarily. I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not trying to condemn Kevin Spacey or anybody else. Um, but you eat, you eating again on microphone? <laughs> I'm trying not to. Do you not have a volume switch over there for your... Or no. do I control all that? No, you control it all. All right. So when I hear that, I'm just going to do this until I hear. <laughs> Sorry. Nom, 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 nom. Um, where the hell were we? What the hell are we Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey. I'm not trying to condemn him or anybody else, um, but I'm not going to overly defend them either because Kevin Spacey. It's not just one allegation against Kevin Spacey. Uh, there are multiple allegations, and. And so you would think, unless you're his conjoined twin and have been there every step of the way, uh, you would you would either a reserve comment, keep it to yourself, or or lay out a blanket, uh, you know, kind of a um, uh, statement saying, well, I, you know innocent until proven guilty it's, kind of a thing it's and, really stupid for morrissey to come out on this uh there, there's no win there for him i mean uh it, it's just dude just just stay on the sidelines man because th- th- this can only end badly for him all right now 20 people have also made complaints about spacey over incidents which allegedly took place during his time at the old vic theater in london oh so this is 20 other i don't know why morrissey feels like he needs to come and defend these guys unless uh morrissey's getting a little nervous himself Following the allegations involving the two 14-year-olds, a representative who has since parted ways with the actor said Spacey was, quote, taking the time necessary to seek evaluation and treatment and that no other information will be available at this time. More so, you know, as soon as this went down, uh, Kevin Spacey felt like one of the best things that he could do is go get treatment for his obsession with 14 or whatever it was, whatever it is. I'm not, I don't want to be a... Uh, Morsey clarified that he condemned sexual violence against, any, against anyone. Yet he apparently also claimed that on some occasions the person referred to as a victim is merely disappointed. People know exactly what's going on, he reportedly said when asked about Weinstein. They play along. Afterwards, they feel embarrassed or disliked, and then they turn it around and say, I was attacked, I was surprised. But everything if, if everything went well, and if it had given them a great career, they wouldn't talk about it. 
What do you guys think about that in the comic section of the, the Wake Dot Show? Well, Sarah adds, she goes, we have live feeds of the Georgia Dome demolition, but all these abuse revelations are kind of shoved behind the scenes. Freaking crazy world. And this is the issue that I have with all of this is that, and, and uh, you know, there's uh, the local and uh, now national uh, media critic, uh, Eric Deggins. And he and I went back and forth on it to the extent that he blocked me from his Facebook page because... Well, I guess so we can't call him on and ask him onto the show? Well, you probably can, but he, I'm sure he doesn't want to talk to me. And, 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 and I told him, I go, look, I, you know, the media is circling the wagons for these people. Like, it, anybody else, if it had been, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm going to kind of wave the partisan flag... Oh, hold on. I'll Might wave well. the... Uh, so, I mean, if somebody had come out... Uh, on again, like like another Roy Moore, right? If this was kind of spreading like wildfire through our political system, the way it is through our entertainment system, you would see it on every talk show and every news show. It, it would be the main. St- but you don't see like you know. Again, Corey Feldman had to subject himself to Doctor Oz just to get his story out. You know, where's the Barbara Walters? Where's the NBC Nightly News? Where's all the Good Morning America stuff? Instead, you got Ashley Judd going up there and apologizing for Weinstein. You know, saying that oh well, we love him and we hope he gets help. And you know, it's unfortunate what he did. And you know, it's it, and so to me, that's circling the wagons. I mean, so what was it, what were you and Eric Deggins going on about going round around about? Well, that, so the Eric fact was saying. This isn't getting the type of publicity that it deserves. This, this, this whole uh, firestorm of allegations and, and basically the, the teardown of, of, of its, the Hollywood power structure it really isn't getting the type of coverage that it deserves. Uh, the stuff that I'm watching, it is. Um, but you, you got to remember, you have to handle all this stuff with uh, kit gloves as the media, You know, whether it's Roy Moore or Harvey Weinstein. Now, granted, the more allegations that come out, once you get to 5, 6, 10, 40 allegations, you can run with it a little bit more. Uh, but that, that's, that, that's that constant battle between, uh, you know, innocent until proven guilty and, well, you know, you might not be proven guilty yet, but we've got enough circumstantial stuff here, enough allegations that we all can start making our judgments. Well, and again, the Corey Feldman thing, that story's been out for years and the rumors have been around for decades and and it's just now that he's finally getting some traction on this. But I think that's the next piece of the puzzle. I think the whole child abuse uh, pedophilia ring uh, in Hollywood, I think that's the next shoe to drop. Um, back to Morrissey. Morrissey clarified that he condemned sexual violence against anyone, yet he apparently also claimed that some uh, on some occasions the person referred to as a victim is merely disappointed. People know exactly what's going on. He say, he reportedly uh, said when asked about Weinstein, and they play along. Afterwards, they feel embarrassed or disliked. Then they turn it around and say, "I was attacked. I was surprised." But if everything went well, then it, it would have given him a great career. They wouldn't have said anything about it. Well, that's why you have these big actors coming out now and talking about it, like Terry Crews, like you know some of these other w- female actors, uh, because it's the power structure. That is exactly what the power structure does. Is, is that they they take advantage of these people who are trying to make a career and they allow it to happen because they think it'll advance their career, uh, but it doesn't make it consensual. I You know, he goes on to say, I hate rape, I hate attacks, I hate sexual situations that are forced on someone. But in many cases, one looks at the circumstances and thinks that the person who is considered a victim is merely disappointed. I'm sure there's those cases, all right? But you're you're trying to defend uh, two people, one of which has twenty plus allegations against them, the other has forty plus allegations against them. I don't think you use that to uh, all of a sudden push forward your a. Some people are lying about this. Some people yeah. uh, know exactly what they're doing, and it becomes assault after they don't get the part that they want. Um, more than f- oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, more that's than f- definitely the wrong horse to to bet on in, in that situation. Next up, next up. So uh, this was a student gets uh, yanked off the air. Student radio DJ gets yanked off the air, suspended after using the word tranny. And we have a video of that here. Um, We're called the queer devil worshippers. For- well, the first thing we hear is queer it's devil. It's kind of like our <laughs> version of Antifa here at Morris. Um, Except they're nicer. They're not nicer. They, they're just more timid. They're, like, they're nicer. They're, in they're the, much more timid. They're nicer and uh, less violent. Well, the only reason they're not violent is because there's not enough of them. And everybody knows everybody here at Morris. 
Like you, you know, you can definitely you see one tranny that's trying to punch someone. You know, it's automatically that one guy that you know I'm talking about. So he says. Uh, so when you hear or see a tranny punch somebody, you know it's exactly. I guess they have one uh, transsexual student on. Uh, wait, is that is that what you're supposed? To, what are you supposed to be saying? Is that right? Trans. Transsexual. Just want to make transgender. Sure. Yeah, transgender. Know. That's what I meant. Transgender. Yep. Thank you. Uh, then you know who that guy is. I bet you know. I'm not going to. I'm not going to dox anybody. And name him on air. But you, you do know if I say the tranny who looks like he's going to punch someone. Mm-hmm. Yep. Everybody on campus knows exactly who I'm talking about. Well, 15 minutes later, the uh, station uh, production manager or station manager came in with uh, campus security, campus police. Now, this is the University of Minnesota Morris, so it's UMM. Their radio station <laughs> is their radio station is on the uh, the west side of the Mississippi, so it has a K in the beginning of its call letters. If you're west of the Mississippi, it'll be W, right? Yep. <laughs> so their radio station is KUMM. Oh, KUMM. So then the uh, pro, uh, uh, the station manager comes in with a UMMPD officer and told us to leave. <laughs> she said we had violated FCC law by saying a word that was never allowed on air. Tranny. Wrong. So we packed up and left. Did you do you think she was li- the uh, station manager lied on purpose? Yeah. Yeah, I think this is kind of the ongoing censorship of uh, seemingly, uh, you know, and I'm just making a huge judgment call here uh, or assumption that it's a conservative leaning talk show on the college radio station there. But based on a little bit of what they were talking about. uh, Yeah, I think it's the ongoing censorship of uh, of conservative speech on college campus. What? I didn't know there was that, that kind of a story. Um, quote, hey guys, I'm just going to have you leave. You said a couple of words that break FCC violations, the manager said, according to the video, which appears to be lightly edited for uh, time. And uh, so far today, I'm going to have you stop your show, uh, specifically Tranny. That is a hate slur, and it is not allowed on radio. I need you to leave. Uh, that is not true. I don't know why she said that. Um, it bothers me when people in authority like that make up lies to, uh, get, uh, to, to make their point, because then, to me, that is an indicator that you don't have the managerial skills to be in that position of power. If you have to go in and make up lies in order to uh, get your point across, then you should not be in a position. Of, you're not a manager. Uh, a quote, or as uh, she says these words, a campus police officer stands in the background of the video shows, do you really have to call the police, the student asks. Yes, she responds. So this is another thing. She, uh, she's too scared. She is uh, uh, not a leader. This person is not a leader. Uh, from that regard, I think it's the it's the right approach. I think if you were be removing someone off the air, I think you it, it was wise of her to bring campus security along with her. Come that being, on. there's three students said, in there that don't that, you know that likely or will not have a radio career at all. Sure. Um, but I, but I but what I mean is, is that I guess you're right. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't know what you're walking into. You don't know what kind of resistance you're going to be met with. But that being said, you're right. She abused her position of power. She incorrectly uh, stated that uh, they were violating some sort of FCC regulation. Uh, and again, I think this is a violation of free speech. She says it's a violation. You are breaking the law. I just need to enter a report. That is a specific hate speech word never allowed on radio, she tells the students as they pack up in the same way that you can never say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, technically I could say it, but I know we're, we're, we decided not to cross this kind of line. Uh, see sucker. We'll just go there on the radio. <laughs> Saying you can't say train. Oh, so in this uh, particular video here, let's see if uh, they do edit it. All right. So this is her coming in after they say that. Here they come. Hey guys, I'm just going to have you leave. What happened? Um, uh, you said a couple words that break FCC violation, and so for nope. today I'm going to have you stop your show. Oh, what word? Specifically tranny. Oh. That is a hate slur, not allowed on the radio. Liar. Liar. Oh. Did you really have to call the police? Yes. Why? Because this is well, a definitely FCC if that's, violation. We, will, we would definitely leave. Um, we could have left. I just need it in the report, please. Screw you, lady. I hate her. I don't even know her, and I hate her so much right now. Oh, yeah. you got it back on My the blood is boiling. 
And I'm willing to bet that these guys already had a target on them. Like, this is probably already a show that they didn't like. But because well, you it, brought in partisan stuff. You said this is right wing, left wing stuff. Yeah, they were talking about Antifa at the first part of the video. And but he was joking. He said, we don't have Antifa here. We got trannies. Yeah. Watching, go ahead and put that. Put this up on the screen. They were just watching them pack up their stuff. <laughs> Is that one of the words before ten when we come to it? No, that's a specific hate speech word never allowed on radio. Quit lying. Way. Quit lying. You're a position of power. You are a station manager. Quit lying. She probably isn't even that. She's. Probably I think just she's a... transsexual. I think she's transgender. Uh, somebody who's still in the closet. And uh, she she started trembling. She was uh, so angry when they just said tranny. And she was so offended. And she didn't know what to do that she called the st cops. She called the university police force. You can never say cocksucker on radio. <laughs> Whoop, there we go. Well, that one. That's after 10 o'clock, too? Yes. There are certain words that um, under vulgarity causes. Oh, You're a liar. New evidence. Do you know how many times we said it? I don't even know. Um, I counted two, but two. that's while I was listening. Okay. Screw you, lady. Screw you. Now the now the c word there in that situation. While that's yes, true, you can't say that on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> but now is is that still the policy about uh, after ten o'clock at night or eleven o'clock at night? That was a, that's a myth. Okay. The uh, safe harbor. Couldn't remember that one. Uh, from what I understand, safe harbor in radio was a uh, was a myth. Like you could play certain things after ten o'clock or after midnight. Um, but really, when it comes to FCC violations, it is and things could change uh, I, I, over the years. I've had many, many conversations with, um, you know, station management, sometimes with lawyers, sometimes without lawyers about what these FCC regulations really mean. And there's not a clear cut, uh, you know, line no. for a lot of this stuff. You know, a lot of people think that George Carlin's. Uh, was it 10 words or 12 words? I think it's seven. seven. Or seven words. George Carlin's seven words was a real thing. Yeah. Was real. It wasn't. It was a bit. Um, and from what I understand, it really comes down to uh, the e each market's different. Yeah. So what, what might be accepted here in Tampa, Florida might not be accepted in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Right. You know what I mean? So yeah. what they call, oh, community standards. That's what they call them, community standards. So it basically because it really comes down to, if I remember correctly, like if the community decides to file complaints, uh, uh, then that triggers an investigation by the FCC, which is, again, you know, our friend next door. That's how he's, you know, one of his biggest troubles got started with the whole pig thing. You know, again, uh, slaughtering a pig, a very normal thing happens every single day, thousands and thousands of times throughout the country. I'm sure uh, a pig was slaughtered over the air. And a lot of people took issue with it, and uh, that was kind of the beginning of the end. Well, I, beginning, what are you talking about? He's, he's still broadcasting <laughs> next door. He's doing. He's hanging in there. He's doing all right. All right. Uh, talking about Bubba the Love Sponge, by the way, for those of you here in the uh, Bay Area and uh, are familiar with Bubba, uh, the facilities here at Bake More Pies in Tampa is literally right next door to the, the, uh, the legendary... Infamous. Infamous Bubba the Love Sponge. But I want to say the uh, stuff that really got uh, him the was... The Bubba the Love Sponge show wasn't uh wasn't the pig thing it was uh once they were, they were running some parody bits that it's sexual parody bits that included disney characters or something like that i mean i don't know there was, i don't remember dude, I don't there remember. was there was so that. much i mean it's yeah. a laundry list of stuff <laughs> still mean, going on oh yeah uh so all right so uh these these kids at kumm i'll uh, get kicked <laughs> off the air for saying a uh, tranny and for whatever reason this this she got so offended by it and um, well, based and then on made up a lie to kick them off the air. Based on her standards, they should shut down the radio station just for the call letters alone. So uh, this guy said that he and the other guy refused to resign and want to, quote, go out with a bang and make the executive staff hold a ridiculous vote for the whole station to kick us out for saying tranny. It's a shame, he wrote, that our freedom of speech is being curtailed today in a very place it should be most free on college campuses. And by the way... Even See, if it, even if that's an that insensitive right. word, like if they're discussing, uh, you know, transgender, to, to shorten it up to tranny, have a conversation uh, uh, with them about, hey, listen, uh, this is the college campus. We got a lot of people diverse. So if you're going to uh, go down that path, uh, say transgender or, or or whatever, because he wasn't being derogatory or defamatory uh, towards, you know, transgender or this one particular tranny. Is tranny is is that is that a derogative? If you say tranny is oh, somebody no. who's transgender, be like, ah, oh, screw you. I haven't jerk. updated my list. 
updated list of uh, what's offensive and what's not. Yeah. Good morning uh, to uh, Cave Hippie, by the way. He says, great show. Got to go to work. Bye. Hey, bye Talk bye. to you soon. Bye, Cave Hippie. Uh, this week, President Trump will announce his decision on the controversial practice of allowing elephant trophies to be imported into the U.S., though he seemed to uh, cast doubt on the decision lifting uh, a ban on the practice. Quote, big game trophy decision will be announced next week, meaning this week, but will be very hard pressed to change my mind that this horror show in any way helps conf- uh, conservation of uh, elephants or any other animal. Uh, this was an Obama era rule that you weren't allowed to bring back elephant heads anymore. I'm okay with it. Yeah. What about you, sir? No, I, I, this goes back to even me, like on a broader scope, uh, with hunting. Um, if you want to go hunting, cool. Like that's you know, uh, congrats to you. But that's not my thing, and I don't get it. I don't understand it. Uh, whether yeah. whether it's deer, whether it's a bear, whether it's a tiger or an elephant or any of that, I just don't get it. I don't get it. Over the weekend, uh, one of my good friends, grow you know, growing up in Okoe, actually. One of my brothers, good friends, uh, a good friend of the family. This backstory is really not important anything. Jeff Dorsey. <laughs> Jeff Dorsey, a great guy. Uh, I see a picture over the weekend. He and his son are off in Georgia or Tennessee, wherever they are, hunting. And his uh, kid, his son Kyle, who is one of the best friends to my nephew, shot, got his first deer. And he was very, you know, he writes, I'm very proud that they're sitting there and they're doing the picture. We're holding the deer up and that whole thing. And I, I, tr- I try to reconcile the emotions that I have in those moments yeah. with with the reality that we live in, you know, because mm-hmm. I don't get it either. Even growing up in Ocoee, I, I, I wasn't part of the hunting culture. Um, but for those who are, I mean, like, you know, but I, so, I, so here's what I have to do when I look at stuff like this. I have to look at my friend Jeff. I love him. I, I, would, do, I would do anything for him and his family. He would do anything for the Fisher family. Um, so am I looking at a, am I a, a psychopath? Like for a lot of people that don't get hunting, you know, uh, and they get very, very angry, very, very quickly. They figure that these people are nothing but psychopaths that are just, a, 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 you know, a step away from shooting people, you know, killing people, that this is an urge to kill versus whatever, whatever hunting, you know, an urge to hunt. Sure. Um, so I'll, I I don't get it. I well, no. keep my emotions at bay. Yeah. But when it comes to big game hunting and bringing trophies home, that really really starts to get my blood boiling. The only way I grapple with the deer thing is because I know my friends who are deer hunters um, will not only taxidermy, you know, the the, the head, right? They'll they'll sometimes do the head mounts, um, uh, and they'll actually consume the deer, right? right. Uh, and that and that, so I can handle that, right? Uh, no, no. Yeah, they're not just killing, you know, you know, something, cutting its head off, bringing it home for a trophy, and leaving it out there to rot. Yeah, but you're not going to eat an elephant. No. Um, and I, I still, I know this is part of where we came from as humans. I can't, I can't go off on it or about it too much. I there's another friend of mine who is a, I would say, a friend and a, an associate of mine. I actually know his son better, um, Wade Boggs. He is a big game hunter. I've been to Wade's house, and there are heads everywhere. Um, but again, you talk to Mr. Boggs and cool dude who, j- who likes to hunt. And I, it, it's just not a part of, I, I, and you want to take people. issue with it, but it's Wade Boggs. It's, right. And you also, in those moments, realize that big game hunting and hunting in general and this kind of stuff is not the sport of psychopaths. Right. Um, and that hunting is something that is very much, very much in our natures as, as humans. Yeah. You know, we've only been civilized or trying to get civilization to take hold for a few thousand years now. Um, but for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years prior, we were hunters. And there's still yeah. plenty of cultures around who are hunters, are hunting. So it's still there. It's still a part of us. Mm. Cords, uh, the chimes trophy in a, part, though, is the thing yeah. that just really... Ugh. Well, Quartz chimes in and he says, uh, the villages eat them. He goes, check out the story of the GoDaddy CEO uh, who shot the elephant. And uh, he'll say that the, but, but. He's got a good point in some of these uh, reservations when, yeah, you kill the lion that you're allowed to kill or you kill the elephant you're allowed to kill. That meat does go to the, uh, uh, the, the village there. Um, Even that. uh, It's the, the dentist last year. Remember that killed the, uh, the famous lion. Uh, or at least he was famous in that area um, where he allegedly or he and his 
group allegedly lured the lion out of the protected zone so they could kill it. Of course, they deny that and say that the the lion wandered out of the protected area. And it's there just, just so you can go, I did this. I killed an elephant. I killed a, I, I don't, I get, and that's when all of a sudden I, I, I realize that I'm standing on the side of uh, the, the hippies and the people on the, I guess you call the left, the liberals and whatever, and go, I don't like this at all. I, I, it just, there's something that bothers me. Yeah. Uh, so I hope that the the president upholds that and says, listen, you want to go uh, shoot some elephants over in Africa legally and that elephant feeds a village? That's fine. You're not bringing the head back. Take a picture uh, and you're not bringing the head back here to put up on your wall. What bugs me is that uh, the media and, of course, those on the left were trying to make it out like Trump was trying Did to bring this back. Did you go to right wing you over the weekend or something? No, it's like- just, I, you know, my, my Twitter, I got on Twitter a little too much this weekend and... <laughs> It just get, it gets me fired up and gets me pissed off. And, and they were trying to make this out like it was Trump, you know, trying to repeal the trophy thing. And he didn't. I mean, somebody else proposed it. And obviously, it's up to him whether or not it goes through. But they, they were trying to make it out like Trump was the one, like, uh, lifting do the ban on this when he wasn't. Uh, yeah, and he's, he's indicated that he is not going to. But we'll see how this plays out. Because he also, one thing that might override all of this is his love <laughs> is his love of overriding Obama-era yeah. uh, executive orders. So this just might be the next one on the list of, I'm sorry, I, I don't think this is cool, but I hate Obama that much, <laughs> and I'm just going to go ahead and overturn this no matter what. Oh, man. David uh, David Capote chimes in. He goes, after seeing you guys on my big flat screen, I'm getting both of you guys gift cards for eyebrow waxing. For, for Screw Christmas. you. That was so cool, though. That was so cool. Yeah. Uh, to get a picture of him watching the show, you know, not on his laptop or his iPhone. He had hooked up, hooked up to a huge screen television. That's there was, right. There was our big ass mugs, yeah. which is what I did over the weekend, too. Um, where did my iMovie go? I did over the weekend, too, because it was just so it just it looked good. I couldn't believe it wasn't perfect. You know, but it, I couldn't believe how good it looked because uh, I'm just working on a sizzle reel for the uh, show uh, here. My wife's birthday was yesterday. I think we're going to have to buy it. tomorrow. She's a Scorpio. <laughs> Happy yes. birthday. Yes. But yeah, I put, my daughter's is today. Yay. Yay. Scorpio. Look at this for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's perfect for the sizzle reel. Uh, yeah. A <laughs> uh, sizzle reel is kind of, a, I guess, uh, kind of a fancy term for a demo. I guess, and so we're putting together uh, stuff from the show to send out to, well, to promo the show on our social media, and uh, and at the same time send it to people here locally and go. This is what we're doing. This is the kind of audience that we're growing, the kind of show that we're doing, and we can uh, we can help you out. Yeah. We can help uh, you know target people directly instead of you know like in radio. Radio is great for advertising if you have a lot of money and you can spend a lot of money for a long time. And you're trying to reach a wide mm-hmm. audience right. too. As you, it's like throwing out a casting net. Yeah. Uh, when you're fishing, but most but most uh, uh, businesses are not in the game of catching all the fish. They need a certain kind of fish in order to uh, you know that comes into their uh, business or whatnot. And that's what's great about online and digital marketing. We can uh, take this stuff, direct it right to the people that we need to, right to the people that you need to, and make it that much more effective. Up next, the state of Florida, uh, despite there you go, I can hear you, can hear me. Despite Irma. Despite the fears of Zika this year, earlier in the year, uh, we are going to break records again this year for tourism. Florida is still getting a record number of tourists, even though the state was hit by a devastated, uh, devastating hurricane. Governor Rick Scott will announce uh, today at a Miami ice cream boutique that a record 88.2 million Visitors came to the state during the first nine months of 2017. This is coming from abcactionnews.com. The state managed to get an increase in visitors, even though Hurricane Irma slammed the state in September. Irma is blamed for at least 70 deaths and plunged much of the state into darkness. Uh, is everybody back, by the way? You know, as soon as you get your power back, you forget about everybody else that does it. <laughs> Everybody's back up and running, right? Uh, except Puerto Rico. Poor Puerto Rico. Uh, Scott said that Visit Florida, the state's tourism marketing agency, did an aggressive ad campaign following Irma to make sure people knew the state was still open for tourists. <clears throat> so good for us. Yeah. Uh, I, I will tell you, though, man, I met some uh, mosquito experts recently. You know, they own a mosquito control company. And Do, do the, they have business cards? Oh, what yeah. What does it say on their business cards? It's uh, Mosquito expert. Mosquito authority is the name of the company. No kidding. Yeah. But uh, the stuff they say, man, that these uh, mosquitoes carry... 
and uh, how susceptible we are. Like, you know, even when you get these uh, little 24-hour bugs and stuff, he goes, oftentimes it was a mosquito that that uh, poked you with it. And, uh, and, and, you know, you think you're catching it from your coworkers or from, uh, you know, maybe even your kids. Oh, it's always somebody else's kids that, I'm, you know, that we <laughs> catch it from. A, yeah. I go hang out with, I, I, I try not to hang out with my nieces and nephews the first week of school. Those yeah. first couple weeks when they go back to school, uh, you know, you know, like Labor Day will happen that weekend, you know. Yeah. And the next thing you know, we want to get the Fishers together. I'm like, no, I'm not. I don't want to be around the kid. I don't want to be around those stinking little uh, germ bags for well, we'll a see, couple and, weeks. And when Michelle and I were together, I mean, it, I got it doubly bad because not only would my daughter go back to daycare, but then she goes back to school. She's a high school teacher. And so inevitably, either one or both would get sick. So it was like, and I, it's a horrible sickness too. It's not one of those that you know you just feel horrible for like two or three days. It puts you down for a couple of days. Oh yeah, and then it lingers for like two months. So I'd like to say this time that I love all my nieces and nephews. <laughs> Do not hug me or kiss me or s- sneeze on me in uh, the beginning of September. Stay away from me for the month of September. Yep. Although other, other than that, we're good. Uncle Chris loves you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, back to Donald Trump. Uh, do you think that, are you following this, uh, the, the, the UCLA basketball players? Um, and this they got shoplifting and that whole thing? Yeah, enough to know that they're both man-childs and, uh, and, and I still hate LeVar Ball. Okay, so you, all right, you know who LeVar Ball is. Because I do, people unfortunately. Are, you know, as the president is saying, LeVar Ball doesn't appreciate what the president did and that he should have left those kids in jail, other people are saying, Mr. President, you got LeVar Balled. He, this is what he does. He gets uh, other people to talk about his name, and then his brand continues to grow. We are watching the culmination of really what is just about every superhero movie storyline, right? So I think Trump has found his arch nemesis in LeVar Ball. Okay, maybe. So it's not uh, Rosie O'Donnell. It's not... No, nah, uh, Rosie couldn't hang. It's not Little Rocket Man. It's <laughs> LeVar Ball has done it again, according to USA Today. Only this time it wasn't sports media outlets or basketball fans taking his bait and advancing his big baller brand. It was POTUS. Never mind the threat of North Korea, the GOP tax reform plan, or the accusations of collusion with Russia. <clears throat> the leader of the free world look, took a moment on Sunday to focus on a man who is nothing short of a marketing genius. Now that the three basketball players are out of China and saved from years in jail, LeVar Ball, the father of LiAngelo, is unaccepting of what I did for his son, and that shoplifting is no big deal, Trump tweeted to his 42 million-plus followers about the incident in which three UCLA basketball players were caught shoplifting and later allowed to return home. Quote, I should have left them in jail, unquote. Then six hours later, Trump tweeted again, shoplifting is a very big deal in China as it should be, five to ten years in jail. But not to Father LeVar should have gotten his son out during my next trip to China instead. China told him uh, why they were released very ungrateful, unquote. If only someone in Trump's inner circle had told him that this is straight out of LeVar's playbook, that he's tried his tried and true strategy of promoting the family products is a to troll people with a higher profile into speaking his name and thus grow the family business. That's right. So I guess he's done it before. The greatest player of all time, saying in March that back in my heyday, I would kill Michael Jordan one-on-one. Michael Jordan responded. Steph Curry, saying in February that his son, Lakers rookie, and then UCLA point guard Lonzo Ball was already better than the Golden State Warrior. Got Steph Curry to respond. LeBron James, saying in March that his 13-year-old son, slash rising hoops prospect, uh, LeBron James Jr., would never be as good as his father. And then many others from the basketball world. For crying out loud, for the win... Uh, even made a top 10 list of LeVar's most outlandish claims. But this is a different level when it comes to exposure, obviously when the uh, somebody with 42 million followers and is the, uh, the leader of the free world is tweeting about you. I think this guy's the Joe Jackson of the 21st century. I think... That, beating his kids, oh yeah, beating his kids into success. I think when when he passes on, or when his kids get older and no longer feel uh, the need to defend him or protect him, I think they're going to turn on him, and we're going to see hear some uh, pretty rough stuff coming out of this situation. Maybe uh, Earl Wor- Woods. Let's not forget Earl Wor- Woods was uh, uh, not the most um, a gentle of fathers. No. Three days later, when asked by ESPN to discuss Trump's part in resolving the situation, LeVar uh, did what he does. Who? 
he responded while downplaying the role of the president. That's all it took. And about his the, this for irony, Trump, no stranger to the PR strategy of creating one media firestorm as way of avoiding another, has managed to take the focus off the fact that the oldest ball son, Lonzo, field goal percentage of 30.8%, is on the track to have one of the worst rookie shooting city seasons in NBA history, or that Lavar's prediction that all of his sons would be uh, one and done NBA players isn't looking so good. All while making the uh, best of a bad situation. Well, so, and he's trying to get them all in the Lakers, uh, which I don't think is going to happen. So you have half the country, uh, I guess, uh, uh, getting all worked up and angry at this Lavar guy. I'm um, saying this is what's wrong with America is you have too many parents raising their kids going, hey, shoplifting is not that big of a deal. Yeah. Uh, and on the other hand, you have half America going, uh, he doesn't mean it. He is just saying uh, uh, inflammatory things. He's being provocative to further his brand. Well, and it feeds the whole narrative that Trump's a racist. Uh I think it does. I, th- I think the fact that he says that he should have left his kid in jail, the fact that, you know, he's now trying to go toe to toe with LeVar Ball, like, <laughs> I think it feeds this whole narrative. I think they can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. For some people, you're right. Yeah. Um, because even for me, you know, come like I said, uh, it bothered me that coming out of Charlottesville, you have our president getting there trying to explain to Americans, uh, uh, trying to get us to understand how there are good people amongst the rates of these neo-Nazis. Then a few weeks later, you have Americans kneeling during the national anthem, their right to protest, and he's calling them sons of bitches and saying that they should immediately be fired. And then stuff like this, yes, you, it, I can understand why some people will go, all right, yeah, when it comes to uh, black guys, he'll, uh, he'll hop on Twitter real quick to, um, and have an opinion. Sure. But uh, I don't know. what. It, so do you think this plays into... Does this make you question? Do you, no. as a Republican, do you do you wonder sometimes about uh, whether or not? I don't think he's a racist, not at all. I mean, I you know, and and again, this is a somebody who's been a media figure for about forty years, at least forty years, uh, if not a little longer than that. And there were never any signs or reports of any type of racial uh, issues, other well, other than some of his business dealings. Um, but, but that's that's something you. I mean, when the DOJ comes after you because you won't rent to black people because they're going to make your, uh, you know, the value of your property go down. That's 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 kind of, you know, right. But I mean, the guy won. Perfectly, I mean, he won an award from the NAACP. Like he also, you know, oh, well, you said he never. He doesn't have any track record. Any of of this kind overt of overt racism, right? Yeah, and so I mean, again, guy has an award from the NAACP. You know, he, he used to attend these fundraisers and galas and all this stuff. I mean, he, the timing might not be great, but he has pictures with you know he was good friends with Russell Simmons for a long time. Uh, you know, and Russell kind of went to bat for him for a little while at the beginning of the campaign until he kind of went too far, and then Russell jumped ship. Uh, but he is somebody who I, I, I truly don't believe that deep down he's, uh, he's racist, uh, but it's, it's about feeding that narrative, not only for Trump, but also to pin that on the Republican party, that they are the party of racists. Um, next up <clears throat> before, uh, let's get back to the estate of Florida here. Cause we were talking about visit Florida earlier. <clears throat> Governor Rick Scott's tourism chiefs at Visit Florida spend a lot of public money taking trips to exotic places to promote Florida as a top worldwide destination. Four former top-level staff members at the state's tourism <clears throat> uh, promotion and its... Uh, where'd you go here? There we go. Sorry, my bad. Um, <laughs> Did you lose your spot? Yeah, and its current top executive spent a combined $150,000 on travel in the past 14 months. That's nothing. At a time when Visit Florida was under scrutiny by the legislator, uh, legislature for questionable spending, including a hidden $1 yep. million dollar deal with rapper Pitbull. I, I think that's a little, a hidden $1 million. It wasn't hidden. The details well, well, of they the had contract. To, yeah, they had to scratch and claw to finally get the, the disclosure of what the dollar amount that was that they paid Pitbull, in all fairness, right? But as no, knowing. They're making know, it sound like it was some kind of a. Uh, shady deal. Yeah, yeah. and it, you know, it wasn't a shady deal. Uh, you know, this is what they wanted in a contract, you know, and these things would not would not be disclosed. And for some reason, the state of Florida signed off on it, which they should never since it's our money. You should they should never be allowed to sign off on a deal that doesn't disclose all that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, but also we broke that down 
is it you know they the, those first stories about the pit bull thing uh you know really made it sound like there was some kind of a secret deal he got a million dollars to make a a music video but when we did our due diligence and started looking into what the deal was mm-hmm. it included a lot where that uh, my florida campaign or whatever that hashtag yeah. was right uh at every one of his concerts that year it was a huge part of the show yeah um let me tell you that that was a steal a million dollars for what is easily one of the biggest artists on the planet internationally right to promote the state of florida which he is from born uh, no, uh, i don't think yeah. he was born in miami um but uh you know, certainly raised in Miami. I, I again, I think that hell, that was that was more than a bargain. I think it was uh, it, it would have been a deal at two or three million. Where's Pitbull? He's American, born in Miami. Oh, okay. To Cuban parents. Yeah, we went to high school about uh, twenty minutes, fifteen, twenty minutes from each other. Um. So. Uh, so anyway, the, let's get back to these guys instead of a pit bull. <clears throat> From uh, San Francisco to Singapore and everywhere in between, the mission of promoting the Sunshine State at home and abroad never ends. The state's ability to attract visitors is a staple of Scott's message of Florida's economic vitality. Uh, and he says the foundation, and he la- as he lays the foundation for a U.S. Senate candidacy in 2018. Yeah. And uh, I can give you some of the background on this if you want to go Please do. a little deeper. All right. So, uh, by the way, uh, I've campaigned for Governor Rick Scott and Ken Lawson, who is currently the head of uh, Visit Florida, is also a great guy originally from Hillsborough County and uh, and was picked up by Rick Scott to go to Tallahassee, and he's been there ever since. Um, and uh, both great guys, but really, so what this is, is uh, two things. One, $150,000 um, in, in a year in travel expenses isn't much, especially when they're traveling to other states and countries to promote the state of florida i mean i think when you do the math anybody that's done business travel realizes that that's not really a lot of money um the other thing too but is all that three this officials is- resigned earlier this year during an extensive visit florida reorganization prompted in part by the legislative yeah. change so that's it looks because- like these guys knew what they were they were you know you say one hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars isn't a lot in travel expenses in 14 months okay well it's not nothing one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in travel expenses in 14 months is a lot of money it is and so it seemed it looks like uh, these guys uh, saw the writing on the wall and went ahead and resigned before it caught up to them well because they knew that the legislature was going to make a big stink about it and that's the next part of what i was about to say okay. which is that you know we have the speaker of the house richard corcoran who is uh, a huge fiscal conservative and he's been trying to slash money out of the state budget in just about every uh, every department that he can. And he saw this as a slush fund in addition to some of the other uh, initiatives that, that the state was spending money on, like um, Enterprise Florida, which was uh, designed to attract businesses to Florida. And uh, so he started cracking down on a lot of this, this these funds that he felt – uh, were unnecessary. Like he doesn't want us spending money on, on sports stadiums. That I'm totally behind. He didn't want us spending money to attract uh, big corporations to move to Florida, which I do think we need some of. And then uh, he came and cracked down on the tourism is, budget. And this is Lawson you're talking about, or Scott? Uh, no, this was the or Speaker both. of the House. Okay, Corcoran. Uh, the Florida Department of Transportation spent nearly $70,000 in travel during the three months ending on September 30th, including paying for department executives to attend a conference in Virginia, Rhode Island, Dallas, and Boca Raton. Florida is a national leader in trans- transportation. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at some of these numbers, too. You see that the most they ever spent uh, per night, the most they ever spent per night uh, night in a hotel, $169. Yeah. That's that's nothing. I mean, you sure. could, it could easily be three hundred dollars a night if they get, these guys were looking to, um, you know, really juice the system there. But if you're, you know, if you're multiplying that by four, right, which is what they're saying is it was it was a team of four that was doing this travel, which is also a reasonable number. So now you're talking about six hundred bucks, you know, and and again, you these little things plus the dinners plus the travel know, plus the, it adds up. And it, but I, and and, then, and again, I think it. We can't just assume that people are going to want to come to Florida anymore. It's a global economy. We need to be well, out there reminding people why Florida is uh, the great state that it is. Well, I, I don't mind that the uh, you know Tampa Bay Times or or any other organization is on our state every step of the way for stories like this, whether it's you know Visit Florida, My Florida, whichever one this one is, or uh, Visit Florida, yeah, or or anything else to want to get in there. And go, hey, you guys, can you explain this money? I'm okay with that. 
They can, they can step sure, forward no, I'm all money. about transparency, absolutely. Right? As uh, Sherry Bailey visit Florida's former chief international marketing officer rolled up $43,000 in travel during a nine-month period, <clears throat> right before she resigned. $43,000 in travel uh, over nine months before she resigned. Alfredo Gonzalez, visit Florida's former vice president for global trade, logged $42,000 in travel for nine months when he resigned. A former, and then uh, Paul Phillips spent $25,000 in three months. Uh, all three officials resigned earlier in the year. Da, 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 da. So I, I have a feeling that there is there is something here. Well, and I think this is more politically motivated than anything. I think this is uh, people who are trying to diminish uh, the governor's chances at the Senate run, which is going to happen. Uh, I think it's also uh, maybe at hand, again, the, maybe the legislature's attempt to dissolve Visit Florida. Uh, and some of the other initiatives that, again, I think have helped us since uh, the the downturn in the economy recover faster than nearly every other state in the country other than Texas. All right. Uh, next up, this is coming from the antimedia.org. Uh, this is a, a group that I follow on uh, on Twitter. They, they have a lot of interesting stories. I never know what to believe, what not to believe, though. Um, and you'll see them. Excuse me, retweet a lot of stuff uh, from Anonymous. Uh, so I don't know if you call this a left-wing organization or or what this is, but I thought it was pretty interesting. The government says Big Pharma kills more people than all illegal drugs combined. A new study has shown that pharmaceutical drugs cause more overdoses and more deaths than all the illegal drugs on the market combined. According to the government's own statistics listed on the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention website, deaths relating to pharmaceutical drugs rose roughly 23,000 last year, which accounts for over half of the total overdoses, overdose deaths in the country for that time period. Additionally, a recent study conducted by researchers with the University of Virginia, University of Arkansas, the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids, and the American Institute for Research confirmed the known dangers of pharmaceutical drug abuse. The study concluded that teens need help before they reach these tipping points for prescription drug abuse. Adults, now this is, uh, you know, talking about teens specifically, which is so difficult trying to gauge, like, you, you know your kid. <clears throat> you yeah. raised your kid. Right. And then all of a sudden your kid starts acting weird. Is it because they're depressed, uh, they're, they're doing drugs, or is it because they're just going through their teen years, you know? <clears throat> and they're still, they're trying to figure things out. So, adults spotting teens with very high levels of anxiety and at least moderate use of other restricted substances should realize that these are students with a high likelihood of prescription abuse. Male teens with a high need to be popular and teens in general appear to be exceptional at exceptional risk. Hey, which is true. All teens, are, that's what, you got you to be careful. They're trying to figure out who they are. There's all kinds of things that are changing in their body and the right person, you know, uh, you know at the right time says, hey, man, this really makes you feel good uh well they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna take it or there's a chance that they could take it male teens are the worst <laughs> campaigns must target parents as well since they uh, clearly underestimate both the physical risk of prescription drugs and the likelihood that their children will abuse these drugs and that's a that's an issue if you're if you're an adult and you have this stuff in your medicine cabinet you're a parent your kids already know that you take uh, anxiety medicine and then they find out that yep. you got Xanax and the kids at school are talking about Zannies and Zanny bars. Um, next thing you know, your kid tries it. And if that kid was as a hot, you know, is already a very anxious child. Um, and all of a sudden they, they calm down and they're like, oh, we're sitting there on the couch. Go, man, this is nice. I don't feel like the world's getting ready to crash around me. Yeah. Then they go back and they do it again and again, just like mommy and daddy. And next thing you know, at 15 years old, 16 years old, they're hooked on drugs. Well, not to mention that oftentimes people are neglectful in the sense that they'll let uh, their medication expire and they'll keep it in their medicine cabinet uh, or somewhere in their house and it'll just sit there and they just forgot to toss it out. Uh, and then unfortunately that kid will find it and uh, that could also be lethal. And the, the other thing is, is that teenagers are also being pushed towards uh, prescription drug use mm -hmm. by their doctors. There's so many kids that, uh, you know, can't sit still in school. I was a riddling because, kid. Yeah? Yeah. How many years? Uh, I don't think I even made it a year. I okay. think I think my mom got weirded out by it 
Um, she saw the physical effect that it had on me. Um, I don't. You sitting there drooling? Yeah, like I don't remember it that way. She just said that it, you know, it, it kind of brought my energy down. Like I was kind of out of it. You know, like she she just saw how and uh, and to the extent that when I wouldn't, when she wouldn't give it to me, sometimes by choice. Um, that teachers would call her and be like, hey, did you forget to give Jonathan his uh, medicine today? You know what's so funny, though, about just knowing you as an adult? Well, I've only known you for a couple months, but uh, you you don't seem like that kid at all. You don't seem like you have the ADD type brain. No. And so I think for me, it was just like I was a social kid, right? I, I would go around and I'd talk to my classmates and, you know, just uh uh, just a beat, you know, that sort of thing. Just, are you high? Are you? I'm not trying to make you, you know, set you up to brag. Or am anything. I high? No, I'm not high. <laughs> are you high <laughs> intelligence? Are you high intelligence? Um, You're a smart kid. I, t- I tested for gifted, but um, but no, I mean, I, don't, I tested I for say gifted any... too, but they never called me back. <laughs> <laughs> Elementary school. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, uh, I think the teachers didn't. F- I, I again, it went back to discipline. I think teachers the felt that. I didn't have the discipline uh, to go to a gifted school, even though I think I I might have passed the test to get in. Well, Wolverine didn't have the discipline to go to a gifted school either. <laughs> Wolverine's pretty cool. Um, as a study, no- a study noted, teens are being pushed towards drug use by the high-stress environment that is created by modern culture and government schools. Many times, these students are even prescribed a wide variety of these medications to help them cope with the stresses of teenage life. And think about how many kids now are... Uh, Adderall is 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 a part of their school, you know, their schooling uh, environment yeah. now. In college, it's college. Huge. I don't want to say every kid in college is taking Adderall during uh, you know uh, exam weeks or whatever they call that. Yeah. But every kid in college <laughs> is <laughs> is taking Adderall. Yeah. Uh, in order to get better scores, in order to retain more as they go into you know exam weeks. So a study by the National Institute on Drug Abuse highlighted this phenomenon, pointing out that prescription drugs are seen as blessed by trusted institutions, the FDA, while increasingly aggressive advertising by drug companies simultaneously floods parents and children with a message that these substances are safe, popular, and beneficial. Think about how often you're sitting there watching TV and one of these these, uh, commercials come on for some prescription drug. And they start going over the side effects. And I'm not, t- but, he, but here's what the companies do. The next time that you're watching TV and you see one of these things, come on, I want you to notice this. Tur- actually, turn down the sound if you want. Mute the sound and just watch what's on TV. What do you see? You see utopia. Mm-hmm. You see perfect friends, perfect teeth, perfect smiles, having the perfect day, playing with their children, bike, mountain bike, you know, mountain bike riding, uh, surfing. Fishing, being yeah. active, having the greatest day of their life in slow motion while the voiceover is going, you could die. You could die this way. You could die that way. You're yeah. likely going to die. If you don't die, you'll bleed a lot. Then you'll die. But while he's saying, and by the way, notice the voiceover doesn't say it that way either. <clears throat> oh, you could die. Oh, but it's a great death. It's a, it's a beautiful, bloody death. It's read in a way that is calming to the ears. The only thing that stands out are the actual words themselves. If you were to pull the text out of that, just look at it on a piece of paper, you would never even think about buying that drug, that prescription drug. But because it's overlaid with a nice voice uh, telling you how uh, great everything's going to be in the beginning of the commercial. Yeah. And then they're showing a guy, he looks like he's 55, throwing a football with his grandson or whatever. <laughs> oh, look how athletic. What a great time he's having with his... Man, his wife looks like she's 25. I have to have this drug. Um, and the, But at the same time, if you just sit and listen to the words, mm-hmm. it's telling you about all these things that this could it could do to you. My favorite are the care. bathtubs out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like a uh, Corona Light commercial. Yeah but for some drug that grows your hair back or something. Cords loves the Boyster Men Geico commercial. That's a good one. I like Where they sing the side effects. I like that one. I, I, I like the, uh, um, who is the country star that's uh, doing it with Peyton Manning? 
Oh, Brad Nation, Paisley. Brad Paisley doing yeah. his nationwide. Well, he's nationwide hysterical. Like, like I'm. Not, I, I. I don't know his uh, discography. You know, I'm not too deep into his repertoire, but uh, he's got some pretty funny songs out there. Uh, there's one called where uh, he looked. Uh, I look better online or something like that. It's pretty funny. Know. All right. Uh, next, let's see what time is it? All right, we got another nine minutes. Jameis. So this story. Jameis. Damn it, Jameis. This story what broke Saturday. Friday or Saturday? Uh, I think it was Saturday. Yeah. Um, Friday. The NFL is investigating Tampa Bay Buccaneers quarterback Jameis Winston after an Uber driver accused him of groping her last year in 2016. A league spokesperson told CBS News on Friday that the matter is under review. Who do you believe here? Who <sighs> Uber says the female driver reported the incident shortly after the trip. In March of 2016, the company called Winston's alleged behavior disturbing and wrong, adding that the NFL star was banned from the riding share app after the incident occurred. Okay, so she didn't report it to the cops at the time, but she did whatever she did with Uber and had him banned from Uber. Uber. The driver who spoke to BuzzFeed News, which we first reported the news, claims that she picked up Winston. This was March of last year. When he asked her to stop at a drive through restaurant while waiting in line, she claims Winston reached over and grabbed her crotch for three to five seconds. He says he only removed his hand when she objected. Winston, 23, has denied the allegations, saying that this is false. And given the quote, and given the nature of the allegation, increased awareness and consideration of these types of matters, I'm addressing this false report immediately. Uh, he added that his he is supportive of the national movement to raise awareness of similar situations of sexual harassment. Quote, while I am certain that I did not make any appropriate contact, I don't want to engage in a battle with the driver, and I regret if my demeanor or presence made her uncomfortable in any way. The Buccaneers said that they are, uh, they are in the process of naming further information on the incident. Now, uh, he had a friend back him, back him up in another story. Well, and they're saying there was a total of three people in the car. Right, but the third person hasn't been um, disclosed. disclosed yet, and uh, Darby. Uh, this guy that played with him at Florida State also happened to be somebody who was a witness to the alleged sexual assault uh, at Florida State that Jameis Winston was accused of that went away. Um, he now plays for the Eagles. He says that he was in the car and that there was a third person in the front seat, unnamed as it stands right now, that they were in the back seat and none of this happened. None of this happened the way that she says it happened. It's tough, man. Uh, I I want to believe, um, you know that that obviously this didn't happen, and um, you know just like a lot of people didn't want to believe the like crab leg thing, you know, back when he was at Florida State, that obviously turned out to be shady at best, um, you know, and it, it's tough. It's a he said she said situation here, and and of course, you know, our natural inclination is to side with. Uh, with the person making the claim? I don't know. I don't know that that's our nat- natural inc- inclination because right now it seems like you have a uh, two dozen pastors in the state of Alabama whose natural inc- inclination <laughs> is to defend Roy Moore. Uh, I, I don't think it is our natural inc- It's my natural inclination to believe the victim. Uh, but I, I it doesn't seem like, man, I'm listening to the radio, reading commentary. Well, poli- Morrissey, look at Morrissey earlier. Politics will make people do crazy things. Yeah, Morrissey's a good example, too. Uh, Morrissey doesn't believe all the allegations. And I'm not saying that I believe all the allegations. Well, look, and people are throwing uh, Leanne Tweeden under the bus for the Al Franken thing. Like, they're they're questioning uh, her claim. Right. Well, that's, that's what sucks about this process is 100% of the time, the victim has to, it will, will be scrutinized. Not 99.9% of the time. Yeah, 100% of the time, the person that comes forward and says, I was victimized, is going to have to be prepared to be victimized again in a different way. Because um, uh, that's that's just what's going to happen. It's, look at this, the Al Franken thing. Al Franken didn't deny this. He says he doesn't remember it the same way, but he doesn't deny it. Yet, you have a people immediately going after her. Yep. Saying, oh, well, she's, a ra- she's in the media. She's a radio show host now. This benefits her. You she's know, doing her, it for attention. She's doing for it for ratings. That's right. For a paycheck. Right. Um, They're even using the fact that she's been in Playboy against her. Right. When the, so so yeah. Once you're in Playboy, if you if you've cro- well, then you don't have any right. Yeah. Then a, then a man at that point can reach up and grab your stuff because you're obviously a whore. 
uh, you're a low class citizen and a, a, sl- a slave girl at that point, and any man of power can do whatever he wants to you because, well, you, you're lying if you're saying you don't like it because you'll take off your clothes for Playboy and then act like you don't like it when I grab your pussy. So Whoa. that's where we are there. What? <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think you could even say that on the radio. You're right. Not really. Not in that context. I can call you a pussy. <laughs> on the radio. No, seriously. I mean, if you, we were talking about FCC. Which you never have, thank you, no. thankfully. Uh, you know, as far as FCC violations go, you can call somebody the P word on the radio. Yeah. Because, and that's different. But you can't use it in the sexual connotation. It's like on TV. It's all about context. Right. And so if you're saying, I'm going to grab her in the P word, then no, you can't say that on television. Unless it's in a news story and you're quoting the president. <laughs> then it's news and you can uh, the FCC rules are very... Uh, and many did. Yeah, are, are, are very confusing. Um, that's about it. That's all the stuff that I had for today, sir. Yeah, man. Um, to go over. Do, do. So, uh, you know, again, I uh, just want to remind everybody, and, and uh, Cord sent us a little, no- a little show note here, which is to remind everybody to like and share the video, and uh, we're actually going to have some uh, very cool ways to encourage you to do that. Uh, we'll hopefully be finalizing our website here to give you an opportunity to win some things. And I'm sorry that I haven't gotten you a bio yet. One of the reasons why the website isn't up and, well, it's, yeah, it isn't up and running is my yeah. fault. They're like, hey, we need a bio. We need a bio. We need a bio. Let me see if I have, because... One of the hardest things for me to do is is write my. I, is it hard for every person to write their own bio to write? You know, every time I do a cover letter, you know, if you're I've had for, to do it plenty of times. I mean, I I just I've been lazy about it, so don't feel bad because I haven't given Mike my bio either. I'm trying to see if I've got one that I've sent somewhere. I don't but ideally, what we're gonna do is is that not only through sharing, but also we'll have a an online form on our website where you're gonna be oh, able to submit your information. Too. Oh, look at that. Hold on. Chris Fisher, known to Hold his on. radio fans simply as Fisher, has been uh, entertaining the masses since childhood with what's, over 20 years of radio. Bro- so what's, it, what's that sexiness going on right there? Uh, so I guess it's been five years since I wrote this one because <laughs> I wrote over 20 years instead of 25 years. Uh, dude, right. that facial hair just totally changes your face. Wait, oh, yeah. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, back when my facial hair still had color in it. Okay, so here we go. With over 20 years of radio experience, broadcast experience, his first exposure. All right, I found my... Uh, Man, you got a, uh, quite a... See, now I'm going to have to step mine up. I don't know that... Uh, his first exposure I, to announcing uh, came at the age of seven. Nice. When he won the part of... Can Mary. we go that far back? I mean, I want a talent show like at two years old. I think you should. I think you should start <laughs> right there. At age of seven, when he won the part of narrator of his church's Christmas play. It, quote, it was an amazing feeling standing at the preacher's podium and knocking that shit out of the park. I'll never forget it, unquote. <laughs> and I wrote all this, like, in uh, third person. Oh, I'm such a douchebag. But He's, nobody knows that. And it, with, with this, it's not easy to write about yourself in third person. Well, see, now I'm going to go all the way back to at least high school. I yeah. don't know that I'll go back to my talent show days, but. He started his own mobile entertainment slash DJ business at 16 and procured a spot in Orlando's number one rated Doc and Johnny morning show as college boy by the time he was 20. XL 106.7. From there, Fisher traversed the state honing his very limited skills in Tallahassee, then Daytona Beach, before finally landing in Tampa in 1998. Fisher represented 97. This is pretty long. Do I, I don't need to keep going. No, because it'll be on the website. All right. So there this you go. week. This week. Let's do it. I found my bio. I can email that over to you. Now, now it's back on you, buddy. <laughs> now it's on me. That's hey, the right. reason that the website isn't up and running is because Johnny Torres <laughs> has not turned in his bio. That's right. And uh, as soon as he turns in, in his bio, we'll have the uh, website up and uh, ready to go. Yeah. I, I, I See, now now you've kind of stepped up the game there because uh, I wouldn't have gone that far back. Man, me neither. <laughs> um, but I, I guess I did. Now I it's back on you, buddy. Oh, wait, wait. Now it's on me. That's hey, the reason right. that the oh. website isn't up running is because Johnny Torres Inception. has not. <laughs> there we go. All right. What else? Anything before we wrap up, sir? Well, you got your normal gigs this week, or uh, yep. what, what's going on with the holidays? Yep. Um, oh, actually, you no, know, you're right. I will be out of Boulevard Burgers Tuesday night. Uh, so for those of you that have a half day on Wednesday or not working this week, uh, come out to the beach. Come out to St. Pete Beach. Uh, trivia night is a lot of fun. Um, and uh, that's 7 to 8.30. It's only like an hour and a half. Uh, but my Wednesday night, no. 
Uh, Park and Rec, normally I'm out there doing karaoke on Wednesday nights, but uh, nope. they got a special event on Wednesday. No karaoke. No karaoke. Uh, this Wednesday night at Park and Rec, they do have a special event. And we're actually going to try to do the uh, show live uh, remotely. All right. Yeah, so that'll, that'll be fun. Yeah. Oh, now we really now you're incepted. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Thank you so much for being a part of the Wake Dot Show today. Thank you for all the comments. Keep them coming. And uh, you know, also you can message me directly. Uh, I've known a lot of you for a long time, and uh, any advice, suggestions, loose thoughts on uh, what we're doing here, what we should be doing here, is much appreciated. Yeah, somebody we should talk to. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, too. Uh, you know what? This would be a cool part. Yeah, you know, you guys have been talking about this, talking about that. I know this guy that's an expert in this part of the industry, blah, 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 blah. And we'll hit him up, you know, bring him up via Skype or uh, Facebook Messenger and uh, have him on the show. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for sharing the Wake Dot Show. That is very important to us. Like and share. Like and share. And we'll see you tomorrow morning.